It's time for the Wally Mathot Show. Now, here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Welcome to the Wally Mathot Show, everybody. I'm Brent Wallace. He's Mark Mathot, the 13-year former NHL defenseman. Uh, Matt, before we get into the show, which is busy today, uh, it's brought to you by SportsInteraction.com, by the way. The Sens return home after a five-game road trip. So they're gone an awfully long time. They come back on a high as getting the win against St. Louis. Uh, now they return to face an arguably lesser opponent in Seattle, which has struggled of late. They've lost three straight. What is it, re- I guess, what's it like to return home after a long road trip? There's always lots of cliches about it, but I've noticed it yeah. over the years. There is an actual thing to this. Yeah, it's legit. Now, I like so you go on a long road trip, certainly with a lot of, like involving a lot of travel, going maybe out to the west coast or south, then over the west and back, kind of like what Ottawa just did. When you get back, it's bizarre. You're all of a sudden back in your own home, and you just you're, you almost just exhale, like as if the job is done. It's a subconscious thing, right? Where yeah. you're a little fatigued from all the traveling, you're a little weary, and then all of a sudden you have to come back and play another game. Um, it's hard to sometimes get yourself back into game mode that quickly with a quick little turnaround like that now granted they've had a little bit of time but still it it can affect you you've seen it i've been through it um that comes down to your leadership group your coaching staff making sure guys are primed you go into morning skate like this today for example they're going to go in there this morning they're going to have lots of meetings player a lot of the players are going to feel a little groggy you try to keep it really short but intense in the morning and that goes against every fiber in my body when it comes to pregame skates but you do that And then you get ready for the game and and you move on. But it it is always a challenge. There's no question. Always the lover of the pregame skate. The one thing, um, Seattle has been on the road. And I don't know their travel schedule, but they last played in Montreal and had an off day. I'm going to guess they may have stayed over. Does that play a benefit to the Ottawa Senators? (laughs) Maybe back in the day, Wally. Like. You can't go anywhere these days, right? Like everyone's got phones and and, yeah. and videos and stuff. So it's hard to play sneaky and head out for a few beers without, you know, being seen by somebody. Certainly in Montreal, they've got some of those seekers that hang out the hotel. Oh, yeah. and they're always kind of paying attention to where you're going when you leave. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, that's short travel. That's an advantage, if, in my opinion, for Seattle, right? Like they've been just two hours down the road from here. Yeah. Um, and, and ready now to play against the Ottawa Senators. So I honestly believe, despite them struggling, I think they will have um, a good outing tonight. I really do. Uh, and Ottawa just seems to play better and, and elevate their game against those top teams. Whether they're winning those games or not, Wally, they, they yeah. just seem to be more competitive in the games that they shouldn't be. And then vice versa when they're playing those lesser teams, right? They seem to kind of struggle with. So um, I'm I, tonight's a bit of a toss-up. I've called a 4-1 victory for the Ottawa Senators, but... At this point, you know, like you, you, they're so unpredictable when it comes to calling these games. It's it's crazy. Like it's it seems like yes, they should win this game. No, and they do completely the opposite. This is an interesting week. This is five games now at home, uh, five straight, and they will play a uh, Seattle, Arizona, Montreal. I think uh, Philadelphia and the Islanders at the, in, in that group. I know Montreal's on the road, uh, and Columbus. Five of those teams are within like the bottom 24, I guess the bottom seven of the league. Like they're all within kind of Ottawa's range. I'm interested to see how they all yeah. play uh, against, I guess, against the Sens. Well, yeah, in theory, they should win just, well, at least in theory, you'd think they'd win at least four of them or they're four yeah. winnable games. Yeah. But I like these predictions and stuff. Like you think, you know what you're talking about at some point, but then it, you watch the way most of the season is unfolded. And it's, it's like, crazy. My, my predictions mean nothing. So, um, you know, and that's, that's what you get on a team like this, right? Like they're, they're sort of, they're sort of midway to out of the rebuild now. Like they're, yeah. they're not completed. Obviously they're still missing pieces, but they're at a stage where they're still very much unpredictable where, you know, earlier on in the rebuild, maybe a year or two ago, you knew that most of the time, if they'd win a game, it was a bonus. Now the expectation level is a little higher, but they're still rough around the edges. They're still thin, yep. as we've talked about continuously on our show. So, uh, you know, for me, I think if you're a fan at this point, it's really easy to shit all over the team. Um, but I think just take a step back, pay attention to the key guys, the core players that you know are going to be here for a while. Are they progressing? Which I think they are. And I think that's a positive. Yep. You're going to... You're going to give yourself a migraine if, if you're counting on this team to win every night. It's just not going to happen because they have too many holes. 
but pay attention to the positives, lean on that for the rest of the season. And then you can be critical of the, out, of the off season, depending on the moves the team makes. So when you go to sportsinteraction.com to make your picks, pay no attention to Mark Mathot anymore. Master Damas has broken the crystal ball. <laughs> uh, anyway, sportsinteraction.com is Canada's online sports uh, sports book and casino. Uh, sportsinteraction.com slash Wally Mathot for the most competitive live daily odds. Sports Interaction is Canada's leading sports book. Uh, Meth, our guest today, uh, one of your former teammates, Chris Kelly. So I, I'm thinking of this after, and it mm. happens every time we do an interview. Uh, he played so long for the Sens. Uh, over 500 games mm -hmm. is that you go in with a plan to talk about certain stories and then you forget a bunch of others or you don't get to them. And that's, I found this for a ton of times. Like today I was like, why didn't we talk about the pesky sins and all this? And I just, I, I forget most of this stuff. Um, and that's the disappointing part. Like there's so many good stories to share with these guys. Yeah. And he's like, uh, Kels is all like, I knew him long before I got to the Sens because I would skate with all the pros during yeah. the summer in Canada. So I got to know Chris Kelly very well there and just, just a dry, I mean, you, you see the interview, just a dry sense of humor, um, kind of almost monotone to a degree, but really, but really funny and, and like yeah. very clever and, and witty. Like you, you try to chirp Kells and he'd just come right back at you with a bomb and it would bury you and you'd be like, okay, it's just not worth arguing. <laughs> so, Chris, but very Chris, good guy. Yeah. yeah and he's yeah. go ahead. Sorry. No, no, sorry. Chris Kelly calls or Chris Neal calls him the best chirper he's ever talked to, like gone up against. So that's huge praise. First of all, um, there was yeah. one time and there's yeah. one time we learned about Chris Kelly's humor. And that was Jason Spezza blocked a shot near the end of the game. And we made it like this, huge deal because we've well we've never seen anything such as such a great defensive feat by jason spezza before so at the end of the game kelly goes yeah we call it a nessie and we're like what are you talking about well it's like the loch ness monster you hear about these things but you rarely ever see it <laughs> and so we've always That's remembered great. this with, with spets is the yeah always called it the nessie anyway um he's now the yeah, uh for, yeah, he's yeah, now yeah. the assistant coach on the bruins bench uh, lots of stories including one of those summer skate stories coming up with Chris Deal um, and lots of stuff that happened during his Sens career. So stay tuned for that. Um, that is brought to you, of course, by Whitewater. Uh, today's guest uh, is the cool, refreshing taste of Kiwi Lime Sour. It's a new beer they've uh, launched, by the way. It's called Funky Fresh. Mm. You can pick it up at uh, Whitewater Beer Shop, whitewater.ca. Use the coupon code uh, WAM-FUNKYFRESH. Uh, to get 15% off, Whitewater, of course, is brewed by friends for friends. It's the official beer of the Hockey Hall of Fame. And don't forget, you can also get home delivery. Mark Mathot, we are on to page two already of today's show. Oh, God. All right. It's exciting, huh? It's like a game show. <laughs> I know. I'm, well, I'm having to scroll to get down to it. Yeah, no, it's, it's all good. Now, have you had Have you had that beer, by the way? The yeah, by the way. We talked about it before. It's, it's right. So oh, it's yeah, right here over my shoulder. They're, uh, they're, they're really good. So, yeah, I, and really I told, and I think I've said this in the past, I'm not a sour beer type of guy. I'm just a sour guy in general. So yeah, but their sour good. beers aren't that sweet, though. They're perfect. Yeah. They're like, perfect. The, the Wild yeah. Bog, which is a cranberry flavor, is really good, too. But, um, yeah, it's this is a great sitting around uh, or sitting in the hot tub type beer, like a Friday. This is a really good beer. I've actually quite enjoyed it. I uh, Did I tell you I, I got rid of my hot tub? Did you like I had yes. so when I moved into this house in Manitick, there was a hot tub there. And naturally it was broken when we moved in. And and that's another story. I'm not going to get into that one. But um from my experiences, Wally, I find they're just a huge waste of money. So what I did was I got rid of the hot tub and I just laid more stone down. And now it's nice and clean looking. So I don't have a hot tub anymore. That's like, my hot tub story. It sucks. What kind of area are you living in now that the hot tub's broken when you buy the house? God forbid I move into a home with a broken hot tub, right? I know it's so, I'm and, hard done by, but that's, we, that's a little adversity that came my way <laughs> and me being, you know, I'm, I just had to deal with it, but I plowed yeah. through it. Like, cause I, you know, it's mental toughness that I had to deal with. And, and you I are a trooper. It. Yeah. I, when Thank we you. first started this show, you were just getting rid of it and doing the patio stonework. Um, and a that's year right. prior right. to that, if that I bought one because the way our backyard set up, we couldn't really put a pool in. Thank God we didn't now to so be able to afford it. But is I we yeah. built a deck and put a hot tub in. So, but here's the best part of the story. Uh, I, I even, yeah. I'm not even gonna I shouldn't even admit this. So 
I didn't ever own a hot tub and I'm not a real big hot tub guy, but my wife wanted one and the kids like, yeah, it'd be great. And I'm like, okay. So we go to, I think it's club PC and they're trying to sell us whatever. And I'm, and they've got them set up in there and they're running. I'm like, well, I don't know if it's any good. Like, is it comfortable? I said, can I come try it out? So my wife no, and I didn't. went to the store and in the middle of the store, we're sitting in the hot tub. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I, I don't think, serious. I, I, are you allowed to do that? Uh, they probably just, I yeah, guess yeah. at that point they're like, uh, you know, like, fuck it. We need the sale. <laughs> like, just let him, let him get his dirty ass in the tub. It's fine. <laughs> it was, I'm like, I don't know if I'm like, am I, yes, I'm an idiot, but I'm like, I want to try it out. And they're like, yeah, no, yeah, it happens. That's, that's and I'd brutal. seen, yeah, well, I'd seen I mean, somebody do it before. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. Well, they, but, they got the sale. Yeah. They got the sale. So it was win-win. Well, good it. for you. Uh, yeah all right now i do you use do you guys do you guys still use the hot tub though at home so, don't lie well i i don't occasionally i do no, that's what my I kid does they never uh, man he comes home from hockey and he sits pure. in it but okay. but the yeah we don't use it enough and i and i knew that i said we're not okay gonna. and they're like my wife's like no no we'll use it plenty i like right. it in the summer yeah. i don't like it in the winter because i don't like the walk to the tub and back same the house that's why i got rid of it yeah yeah. I'm, I'm I feel so bad sorry. now because Craig's probably thinking, are you guys seriously talking about hot tubs for 10 minutes? <laughs> Why don't we just move on with the hockey talk? <clears throat> All right. Well, let's get to the hot topics. Uh, <laughs> Craig is just, oh. I know he's just losing his mind right now. Uh, we talked an awful lot about Anton Forsberg in the last show, but I don't know that there's a bigger topic with the Ottawa Senators of late. So I did hmm. some digging. Best single season save percentage since 27-18. Uh, it's his a minimum 20 games played by the way. So Anton Forsberg and then Anders Nielsen owns the next two. And then it's Matt Murray. Uh, and then it's Marcus Hogberg or Hogberg. I guess it is. Anton Forsberg has a 921 save percentage math. I, I used to be with Mike McKenna and thinking that they got to trade him. I'm, I am now, I think I'm back to, they need to find a partner for Matt Murray somehow. And they got to move Philip Gustafson because I'm not sold that he's the number one guy either. I think Anton Forsberg is your guy. Yeah, well, and in, and in fairness to McKenna, he didn't say that Forsberg should be the odd man out. He just thought he would be based off of the finances and the budgetary issues or whatever. Like having a third one way deal on you know in goals tough and depending on what he would like. However, I agree with what you said. I I think it's it goes without saying that. He's obviously an NHL goaltender and, yeah. and would be very serviceable as your number two, assuming Matt Murray, you know, can find that, which he has found the consistency. It's more just staying healthy. I think at this point, that's been an issue, but um, I think if you're, you know, in an ideal situation, Forsberg's your number two based off of the way he's played. I mean, he's earned that spot, uh, but I'm not a goalie specialist and I'm not going to pretend to be one. I only know that he's doing the job right now. And I think, um, you know, at this point, he's done it long enough that I think he's earned um, that right. But I, it just comes down to what he's looking for, Wally. Like, I, I don't okay. even know where we begin when it when it comes to contracts. Like, like he's I probably going to want a little bit of term at his age. He's not going to sign a one year oh, deal, right? Right. But he, but he went. He's making whatever it is, seven hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars. Like, there, he's not going to suddenly make three and a half million dollars. Well, he might make. Yeah, but would the team be willing to shelve out too? Okay. So, but if they shell out two. Here's what I'm thinking. So I'm going to go way back to 1998-99 or 99-2000. Uh, it was the last time I really remember Ottawa doing this. They had Ron Tugnut and Damian Rhodes, and they split. There was no real number one guy. And it, it worked for them. And nowadays, we're talking about so many condensed games that you're almost splitting now that you find another quality backup comparable where you're spending the same amount of money that you're spending on basically Matt Murray to have two goaltenders. Now, the whole Matt right, Murray right. thing is going to have to be either bought out or, which I don't think they're going to do, and they're going to have to find a trade partner and half the salary, all that stuff. I just think that it's right. a, it's I think it's time to move on from Matt Murray. I think for both sides, I, I just think that there's a lot of frustration right there, and I and you can sense the way they talk about Anton Forsberg, and I don't think it's necessarily lip service of how much they appreciate what he's been able to do. You tell yeah. me. And if he's, if Anton Forsberg is your goalie right now, do you want him to be there at the end of the year? You're the player. Yeah. Well, I think, 
<clears throat> the, the biggest question, well, at least for me, is what are you going to do with Matt Murray? Are you going to buy him out? No. Like, what are your options? Like, what, Ottawa's not doing that. So he's going to be here. Uh, but I agree with you that, uh, what, the worst case scenario, if you keep Matt Murray, which is fine, because he, he's been playing well when he's healthy. I think, uh, what, at the worst case, you have you got Forsberg to split games with him. That's not a terrible scenario to have. Um, so I'm okay with it. Uh, Gustafson kind of leaves me with some question marks. I don't know what you do there. Do you just have him down there in the American league at, on a one-way deal? Like I, I that's, that's the thing. I, I don't know what the right play is. And then of course, you know, cause, cause Forsberg, how old's Forsberg? He's like 29, I think is he, he's up there. He's close to 30, yep. isn't he? So, yep. you know, like long-term who's your guy, who's your guy in five years from now? I, you know, and now to answer my own question, typically goalies do mature much later. I mean, we saw that with, we see that with almost all of them. Like look at Craig Anderson, a lot of these guys, they can play up and, you know, they depending on how well they can take care of themselves. And with a little bit of luck, they're usually very effective, even in, in towards their mid thirties. So you do get a little bit of longevity there, hopefully with some of those guys, but like, like I said, and I got to preface it with this, I'm not a goalie expert. You know, I, I watch them. Are they stopping the puck? And is the team responding and playing well in front of them? That's usually what I'm looking for. They seem to play pretty well in front of Murray when Murray's healthy right now. And they seem to be doing pretty well in front of Forsberg as well. So, But they don't you know, get I, a healthy Matt Murray. Know. That's the problem. Yeah. I agree. So I you agree. never know, know what going, you do. What you do never you know do? going into the game if you're going to have him or not. Yeah, and that's tough for a player. It, yes. it is. And I, you know. And it, Matt Murray's been through quite a bit over the last couple of seasons. Like, you know, he's had to, he's got the baby, the move, all that stuff. And then playing through COVID, a couple freak injuries. But I mean, at some point you can only deflect so often, right? And you have to give a fair, hard assessment on what you have, because if this is a trend that continues, it's obviously a huge concern for the team. All people deal with stuff, right? All I know. like, I know. There's tons of NHL players dealing with stuff that we don't know about and just people in general. Sure. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, so I'm just, like, so what in closing, in closing, yeah. what's like, you know, so instead of just going around in circles, <laughs> I think you and I both agree that Forsberg has to stay. Murray's a bit of a question mark, but if, and I, you know, they did the whole thing last summer where he had to put on some weight and yeah. obviously that's not helped. And McKenna sort of addressed that a little bit too. Right. When he talked yep. about, him having to address that same situation back in Pittsburgh where he had some issues. The team wanted him to bulk up a little bit. I mean, I think his, you know, his physiology is, is what it is. He's just a tall, lean looking dude. That's not going to be able to bulk up over one summer. No hockey player can do that unless you take the whole year off. So he's not going to change what you have now is what you're going to have next season. Right. Do you, do you remember? Uh, yes. And I don't want to get away from this topic. So I will just say, I'm not, if Philip Gustafson and Matt Murray are goaltenders next year, I am not a very excited Ottawa Senator fan is all I'm saying. I don't think too many people are. Uh, you talk about bulking up and uh, Drake Batherson. I'll never forget this. So him coming out of his first year when he played in Ottawa to his second season, I guess his first full year, he, yeah. he put on 19 pounds. I think it was. And so yeah. I said, like, what did you do? He goes, I ate McDonald's for the first 30 days or for the first month. <laughs> And then he goes, then I hit the gym yeah. really hard. Yeah. The bulking up thing that people are always shocked with. That's that's yeah. you don't get that with players in their twenties and thirty. Like it's, it's a, that's just filling out for players that are maybe a little later than others. Yeah. Like for me, I, my fill out years were like 18, 19. I put on about 20 pounds over one summer and I was eating subway every day after my workouts followed by a huge shake. Like it was insane. I look back now and I'm like, Oh my God, how did I do that? And then I remember having to run, uh, we were doing like a, like a two mile run test in London with the Knights. This was at, well after I was drafted. And, um, I remember having to like, like lug my own weight around, around the track. It was, it was wild. Like I felt like this big lumbering tank just running around and I was 19. So I don't put too much weight into it when players are like, well, yeah, you know, so-and-so put in, put on 15 to 20 pounds this summer. Oftentimes you shed that weight within the first few months, at least yeah. half of it. And then you hang on to the rest, obviously, because you're just getting that man strength, that man weight that you're putting on into your early 20s, right? Like the comparisons of Brady Kachuk from 18 to 21 would be, it's yeah. Just I mean, it's just that's different. just growth and turning yeah. into a man, right? That's what that is. So did and, you and obviously putting in a little bit of work? Yeah. How much did you weigh in London? Like, were you did you run two miles with 200 pounds of sled behind you? 
I uh, I went into London as a 17 year old. I think I was like around 185 to 190. And then I got drafted that summer after my first year in London. So that summer, um, like trained hard and ate lots. And I think I came into camp around 226. So I, I like almost 25 pounds heavier, but then obviously trimmed down a little. And I think I yeah. ended up hovering around 218 for that season. But did you have yeah. to, you said you had to run around with the weight behind you. Did you have to run around with 200 pounds behind you? Like, how no, you I'm it? saying, no, I didn't, I didn't oh, pulling just weight. You, I mean, I mean uh, the, the weight that I was carrying. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, I thought you were like this, literally this carrying weight. Well, did yeah, you? no, 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 right. no, no, you, This but would I'm make more sense. It's very common for young players. Yeah. yeah it doesn't matter. If, <laughs> if you, did you watch the Shaq TNT gas thing? Yeah, the $20 in the <laughs> tank on Wednesday yeah. and then getting yeah. it back. Yeah, yeah, I watched the whole That's the greatest yeah. TV I've ever seen. Um, it's ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was entertaining. <laughs> well, moving on. Um, Nick Paul, which we used to think was perhaps untouchable. Just get him signed. Uh, we are 10 days, whatever it is, out till the trade deadline. And now I'm, I'm not sure that Nick Paul is going to be an Ottawa senator. You think he's going to get moved? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's quiet. Call. I think the negotiations are very quiet right now, to be honest, from what I'm yeah. understanding. Yeah. And if so, in his last three seasons, which are now basically all the same uh, 56 games each, he's got nine goals, five goals, 10 goals. He like uh, 20 points, 20 points, 17 points. Like he's not, is that a $3 million guy? No, it's not. And I love Paulie. Paulie knows I love him. Yeah, I'm a big fan of his. Great dude. Um, but you know, and and you look at his numbers. I mean, his, his ice time's gone up a little bit, but he's he went from being a plus player to a dash sixteen. And listen, I'm not. I don't lean on plus minus. Doesn't always tell the whole story. I'm fully aware of that. But when you've got that big of a gap or that big of a turnaround for the worst, um, that's not good. Uh, now his role could have, has changed a little bit. There's been a ton of injuries. He's he's been interchanged with a lot of different players. Um, hasn't had the same line mates the whole season like he did last. So that can affect your play as well, uh, big time. In fact, but um, I'm a little concerned there because and and I got to be fair. You know, I I don't want to be I want to be a fluffer and just be positive all the time. You know, I want to make sure that I'm giving everybody a very honest shake. Um, I, I found, and it could be due to the stress of negotiations, which I've been yes. through and I know how hard it is, but it feels like there's an, there's an edge or a bite that's out of it. That's been taken out of his game. Um, was, it's like that little you. extra, that little extra, like, you know what I mean? Yes. It's the distraction. He's such a big guy. He, yeah. And he's such a big, he's such a big man. He's so powerful and he's in such yep. great shape and strong. And I've said this before on the show. I'd like to see him like just bully players more, be the bully out there a little bit when you need to be, you know, like, like impose your will on players, because if you're not doing that, that's a huge take out like strength that you're just taking out of your game. That's eliminated. So now you're just basically leveled off with every other player out there trying to maybe match their skill set or whatever. You have to use all your tools when you're a six foot five beast playing up front, like get to it. Get into it a little bit after the whistles. You know, I'm not saying fight guys. There's barely any fighting anymore anyway. But like, get, go to that net front and get right in front of that goalie and cast a shadow over him and bump into him a little bit. Bump into those defensemen. Create scrums after the whistle. You see Chucky do it a little bit. Um, though that's that's one area that I think would really open things up for Pauly. If he was just a little, if he would impose his will a little more on the opponents, I feel like it would give himself a little bit more time and space. And he probably probably get a little bit better production offensively too. Easy for me to say that in the comfort of my home, of course, but I'm just saying that if I wanted to be a little critical, yeah. that's one area that I think he probably could be improving on this season. But I think that that quietness that we're seeing in his game right now, a lot of that has been attributed to the stress of the negotiations. Cause for some players, I was one of them. It weighed on me big time and it's probably weighing on Nick Paul a lot too. I completely agree. You don't know where you're going in the next week. You could be on the move. It, it does play a factor. Um, it's hard. Yeah. I'm wondering uh, if your wife has disconnected the Methernet today because you're uh, you're off a little bit today. It's been going so well. Is it slow? It's, no, it's just your oh, mic. No. Your mic cuts in and out. Can't find good oh. help these days. I don't know. Um, yeah, sorry. 
<laughs> it's all good. Uh, by the way, spring uh, just around the corner where you're going to start doing your cleaning around the house, but also out in landscaping. Uh, might be time to start thinking of uh, maybe redoing your driveway. Need some landscaping stone aggregate? Uh, all that stuff. Bonisher Excavating is here to help with the competitive pricing on your landscape needs. Give them a call, 613-432-1120 or go to BonisherExcavating.com. BEI, helping to shape the Ottawa Valley course. You'll just have like the heated driveway probably, eh? Like Connor McDavid. No, I can't afford a heated driveway. Absolutely uh, not. <clears throat> Spets had one in Westboro. Yeah, well, Jason Spets is on another level and he's still <laughs> playing in the National Hockey League. So he there's is. that. So good. Uh, I'm yeah. just waiting yeah. for that. I'm hoping he gets to a thousand points, but I'm not sure he's going to get it done this year or not. Um, yeah. last topic before we get to uh, Chris Kelly, uh, Colin white, we've seen him return. We've seen him put up some points, got five points, uh, only four shots on goal in his last four games. However, I think it is, uh, in, so he's played six games. Are you now of the mindset, having seen him play that he, all the bio talk should settle down and he should just be perhaps the fourth line winger, despite what his contract says. I mean, how comfortable are you paying him that? Like, I, I just, oh, so this is a tough, this is a really tough one to wrap my mind around because again, another really well-liked player in the room. And I, I have a soft spot for that because I know how important it is. I'm not saying good guy in the room should be making four and a half million playing minimal minutes. I'm not right. It's not what I'm trying to say here. It's just, these are difficult decisions because they're impactful players, you yes. know, in their own right. And, you know, like, so last game, wasn't he centering Nick Paul last game? Wasn't he on the third line last game? Or am I wrong there? I think no, he I was. believe you're anyway, right. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he's found a niche, but the problem is, and this is the conversation that you have to have if your management is, you know, once Pinto comes back in and then of course everything gets, kind of bumped down obviously he's no longer on that third line you know what kind of role does he have on this team and i just don't see it i don't i think okay, if you're so, the ottawa senators it, it's in your best interest to move him if you can really i do think that okay so here's what i'm going to throw out to you one you don't know what shane pinto is going to be like after having missed basically a season I agree. Of so yeah. what's to say that shane pinto is not your fourth line center and your third line center is a guy who you can trust which can whether like so when you watch Colin White, is he not a serviceable third line center? Yeah, he is a serviceable line, third line center, but is he going to be your third line center moving forward? That's the question I'm asking because if you've got Norris, Stutzla, and Pinto, Pinto's not playing fourth line minutes. Are you kidding me? Okay. He's not. He's, so you he, can move he's, he's, so move Colin White down. Move him to the fourth line. Okay, but the, so now you're making now your fourth line centerman who is not moving up at any point um is going to be making 4 and a half million or whatever it is. On that are line, the, are, I mean, the, just, are the Ottawa Senators suddenly cash strapped and stuck at the sorry, not cash strapped? Are they at the cap ceiling and suddenly have no room to move? It doesn't matter if he's well, making four million, they don't well, have it matters any if cap you're a small issues. market. It matters yeah, at some point, you've got to okay, pay. Don't Wally, you're being disingenuous though, because we know that the team has its own internal cap. It's not, they're not going to yes. spend the cap, it's a small market team, and I don't blame them for that because they're a small they market, they promised team. they would so. Well, how it's do you want to respond to that? Okay. Well then if you said so, then you're right. Let's bring him in. Let's bring in another $5 million player to play with Colin White on the fourth line too, because they have cap space. And then and let's bring in Zidane O'Chara for a, another victory lap year and pay him five on the third pairing and everyone will be happy. And then you've made your point. I'm going to shut your microphone down. Um, <laughs> the I know what you're all I'm saying is I don't think there's a rush to move him because you don't have cap space. You don't have an oh, issue. Oh, yes. No, I'm agreeing with you there. I'm not suggesting that you move him right now, but they're going to have an issue. Like this is going to be an issue going into training camp next year. I mean, really, it will be whether you like to admit it now or yeah. later, it's going to happen and it's inevitable and you're going to run into it and you're going to have Colin White sort of in that 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 forward line purgatory situation where like where does he fit like just sort of in limbo and so i if you can move right. him now that's a can bold move you got to make bold moves man like, yes you i make, agree you know you, you can't you can't just make safe plays all the time you're going to constantly be in that perpetual state of mediocrity you got to make a move i agree and, and you have to give up assets in order to make the move but i will okay so here's my question for you is this a playoff team 
if your right side consists next year, Drake Batherson, Connor Brown, Colin White, Austin Watson. It can be. It can be. It, it, if they're healthy, I mean, I like those top two lines. If those top two lines are healthy, I don't mind that at all. I mean, you can't – when I go after a top six, yes, if, I, if one was available – we yeah. all know how difficult that is. I'm not going to get into it. I'm sick of even mentioning it. But, um, <laughs> but, but I don't mind this layout right now. I, the, the, the big question is, even when healthy, does this look like a playoff team to you? It, there's an argument there. If they go after, if they get a top four on defense and they get some consistent goaltending, sure, they, they could slide in the back door next season. But that was the conversation or the expectation level rather for this year. And now yes. it's being bumped, you know, we're pushing it back. It's like a, you know, we're sort of in a bit of a rut at this moment. So uh, I don't even know where to begin because like I said, they need a top four on D. Am I content with white uh, in this lineup? Sure. If the team doesn't mind paying a $4 million centerman on, th on the fourth line, that's what it comes down to. Right. So, and I wasn't going to bring this up. I was going to move on, but They've just played 56 games, which is the same number they played in a full season last year. They have yeah. lost three or sorry, they they have three less wins than they did at this point last year. So uh, the winning percentage is down. The save percentage, however, is up and goals against is down. Like there are some signs of turnaround. Are you satisfied with where the team is at now compared to what they were supposed to have taken and in a step. And you can use the COVID and injuries all you want, but other teams have had to go through COVID. If I'm not mistaken, the Colorado Avalanche lost Nathan McKinnon for a while. They seem to be doing okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. Colorado is pretty deep though, but I do agree with you. Uh, uh, you know what? For me, I had higher expectations for sure. I think most people did. Yeah. You know, I, the inconsistencies that we saw out of the goaltending, like that was a big narrative this year, especially early on, right? Those, that first yep. half, it was like, we didn't know what we were, you know, we didn't know what Ottawa had back there. It was Matt Murray or it was Gus, or it was, there was always the, the new flavor of the month and yep. whoever goalie was able to string together a couple good games was all of a sudden, you know, the savior of the team. So that need, that needs to be addressed. We need way more consistency there between the pipes, but I mean, other than that, I, I mean, I think a lot of us predicted this team just barely kind of missing the playoffs. I think in the summer when we were talking about it with this team, I had them just outside looking in. That wasn't really something that I was surprised with. I was hoping that they would still take a step forward individually with a lot of players, which I think for the most part, you've seen that next year though, like the pressure is going to be on like right out of the gate too. And, and it's going to fall on the general manager. It's going to fall on the coaching staff. It's going to fall on the leadership. That's when the team is really going to start feeling the heat. Cause at some point you can only run these excuses, you know, back and forth until it finally nips you in the butt. And right now they're okay. They get the benefit, but I really think that they're going to need to make a bit of a splash this summer. Wally. If DJ Smith struggles out of the gate next year, like he has the last two seasons, is he going to be relieved of his duties? I, I like, I like DJ. I like him. I, I just think that that naturally, depending, it doesn't matter whether you like the coach or not. Naturally, you're going to have a little bit of pressure on you if you continue with that mediocre start. Like that's no. just, it's just not good enough, right? Like this is a business of winning games, and you know the the personal aspect or personal side, the feel good stories, they can only last for so long. You know, at, at some point you need results. Well, that's the thing. They say you can't win the Stanley Cup in November, but you can lose it, right? And so you can be out of the cup, yeah. right? And a long sure. way away. And then the season gets really long and you don't have hamburger runs very often. Uh, yep, all right. I agree. That, uh, before you get any more mad at me, uh, we're going to move on. Um, coming up after the break in the Whitewater chat, Chris Kelly, the Stanley Cup champion with the Boston Bruins, went to two other Stanley Cup finals. Lots of stories to share with Kels. Uh, that's coming up in the Whitewater chat. Uh, you're watching the Wall and Mathog Show. All right, welcome into the Whitewater chat. Former Ottawa Senator, Stanley Cup champion, Spengler Cup champion, Olympic bronze medalist. I could go on and on, uh, but one of the all-around good guys and the greatest player to wear number 22 for the Ottawa Senators in case uh, Sean Van Allen's listening. Chris Kelly, welcome <laughs> to the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. I don't know. Eric Condrew is pretty good. There's a, there's yes. a lot of 20. <laughs> no, no, no one's as good as you. Uh, we got lots to talk about today. Uh, lots to go back on in history. 
you had probably you were at the peak of the Ottawa Senators and their highs of going to the cup final and the lows of that whole entire clearing out of 2011. So uh, I want to start also meant, should mention that you're a London Knight to go with Mark Mathot. It seems everybody on the show lately is a London Knight. Um, when you were drafted, you finished uh, your career, by the way, eighth most games played of that draft in 1999. Did you foresee your career ever panning out this way? Um, I don't think so. To be honest, um, I was pretty happy to get drafted. Um, it was all, you know, I was so raw. I think looking back on the whole drafting uh, year, I was just, I was happy to be playing in the OHL. And then, you know, for my name to get called at the draft, I was excited. And then obviously Ottawa, you know, being from Toronto is close to home. And then, you know, I never anticipated, you know, having the career um, that I had, obviously I played four years in the American league. I played a little yeah. bit in the, the United league. There were some times where I thought, okay, you know, that this is you know going to be my hockey path and uh, we'll see how far it can take me. Ended up being the captain in Binghamton. I, I want to say Belleville every, every once in a while, but um, like, did that really form you as a player, if you will? Cause you went down there and excelled really well. Uh, and everybody kind of kept talking about, well, Chris Kelly's coming, Chris Kelly's coming, but you were ready once you, I basically, once you got here, except for that first season, uh, we're ready to be an NHL player. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Ottawa always had such a strong team and every year you'd come at, you know, come to training camp and there'd be 13 or 14 forwards signed to one-way contracts. So, you know, realistically, you're just trying to, you know, put on a, you know, a good show to possibly get called up at some point. And, you know, Ottawa always had good, good teams. So you had to you know, bide your time in the American league. And you know, I learned a lot down there. Um, I think coming out of junior hockey, by no means was I ready to, to play in the NHL. And uh, I had a few coaches uh, let me know that along the way. Um, and <laughs> who, and, and who right, told you? And rightfully so. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe one that I'm working with right now. I don't want to name names. <laughs> But, uh, you know, he was bang on. You think you come out of junior hockey and you had a pretty good junior career and you get to pro and you think you've, you've figured the game out. And, and, you know, there's so many details that I just, I didn't understand at that time. And it took me maybe longer than maybe the Sens had hoped uh, to figure them out. But, you know, that's why the Sens are such a, you know, a great organization. They were patient with me, I think. Other organizations maybe would have moved on from from a player like myself, and um, who knows what would have happened. But they had the patience in me, and maybe they saw something. So you know, when I did get called up, I, I felt like I was truly ready to make that jump. Uh, time now for pearls of wisdom, brought to you by SportsInteraction.com. That's where we give a little bit of information, background on our particular guests, a little bit something guys don't know. Five hundred forty-five games, career games with Ottawa. That's the tenth most in franchise history. 80 goals scored with Ottawa. That's the second most by a third round draft pick. The first, by the way, is Zach Smith, who had 94 goals. Uh, 21 shorthanded points with Ottawa. That's fourth in franchise history. And one career hat trick. December 5th at the Rangers. I'm sure you all know all about it. Uh, a 3-1 win. You scored all three goals. That's pretty impressive. And yeah, and I got second star that game. So I, I knew <laughs> I was never, ever going to get first star. That was the stars aligned. I just, Pascal LeClaire got first star. I was like, <laughs> I, I don't think I'm ever going to get a, a first star. In the and I was okay with that. We got we won the game 3-1. That is awesome. Um, as I said, I, I've talked to some players about you uh, just to try and see, like, what was Chris Kelly like in the room? Uh, known to be sharp-witted, so I'm a little concerned if I say something, you're going to come back with me with a pretty good sarcastic response but can you talk about the shake shack in uh new york i heard uh oh even i remember that <laughs> <laughs> i heard during the playoffs in 2017 like you could not get enough of shake shack in new york oh it was the, it was the sense fault there they put our hotel right next to shake shack <laughs> yeah. and uh you know i was i was being a good soldier i think cheering on the the team so i wasn't uh maybe playing regularly so I indulged myself in a, in a few meals over there, went over to the flight club in New York city, bought some shoes, probably back to shake shack, you know, it was, <laughs> I know where he got this information from Brent and uh, he wasn't too far behind me. So uh, I won't name names, but uh, 
Yeah, eh? I, I do. it's a great, I, it is a great spot though. And like they're in the States for those who have no idea what we're talking about. And they're terrific, <laughs> unbelievable milkshakes, unbelievable burgers and fries, a little pricey. So the premium yeah. only goes so far, but it was very good. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Yeah, we, uh, we have one close to our house in Boston and I gotta, <laughs> I, I, I find myself going over there too many times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's always a yeah. lineup. It's crazy. Um, yeah. Alfie skates. So this is a story I know you've told over and over again. Um, but I don't know that I've ever actually sat down with you and had a long conversation about this. You, so you are credited with saving Daniel Alfredson's career because he couldn't <laughs> find skates. And for whatever reason, he tried yours. Do you want to give us your version of events? Um, by no means did I save Daniel <laughs> Alfredson's career. You don't want to just, claim that title, Kel? <laughs> no, no. Let's just put that out there on record. Um, Alfie, I guess, was having a tough time when you're with, with, with skates. Just couldn't couldn't find um, the proper pair. And, you know, for those who have played with Alfie, he's pretty particular about his equipment. And um, he happened just to grab an old pair of my skates um, and, and threw them on and, I guess enjoyed them, liked them, whatever. Maybe had a couple points that game and had nothing to do with the skates, um, but but he thought it did. And um, so I got new pair of skates probably every two weeks to break them in for Alfie. I like to think <laughs> I just got to stay in Ottawa a few years longer than I should have. So uh, um, it, you know, a backstory to that. So when I came back to Ottawa um the second time round we were playing in san jose and obviously daniel was working for the team and he came he uh there was like an optional skate and they you know they they needed someone to, to shoot on the goalies and they asked alfie alfie came to me and said you know can i borrow your old pair of skates i said you can have my new pair of skates whatever go ahead have at it whatever you need i ended up scoring that game and uh, for you that 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 saw me, you know, that second time round, goals were, were few and far between. So I credit Al for getting me a goal that year. So um. <laughs> that's good. It's, he was so particular with his equipment. Even when I got there, Kels, like he was always, I still have that visual of him getting ready for the game. And then he puts his wheels on and then he would stand up and try to like flex them out and do it, does his little like pirouette walk around and goes back. Incredible. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. And I think he was obviously. You know, his legs were so big, so strong that, you know, he put a lot of torque and a lot of, you know, strength yeah. on those skates. So, um, you know, he, he knew what he wanted. He knew, you know, how he needed to play and what made him feel comfortable. And that's pretty much how that story was. Like I said, I was happy to, to break new skates and I like new skates. It didn't bother me one bit. And like I said, I think I got to stick around Ottawa longer than I should have because of that. <laughs> so good. Um uh, do you remember a particular incident of someone hiding in your closet uh, when you came back to your hotel room? Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. So obviously, I know exactly where you're getting your stories from, Brent. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw the backstory. out. So obviously, when we get to to uh, hotels or we come in on a bus and there's a table full of uh, full of our room keys with their names on it. And generally, there's probably two keys. Um in in the the card so i go up to my room and i was one of the last ones off the bus and go up to my room and sure enough i will get in there and, you know i take my my drop my bag or whatever and all of a sudden you know someone pops out of the the closet door and there's neil or you know obviously i was terrified you don't expect someone to to pop out of your closet well i don't know maybe some people do i i did not um so obviously he grabbed my key, one of my keys and went up to my room and, you know, had a good create, laugh. Did that create a little PTSD for you? Like on the oh. ensuing road trips? <laughs> oh, always. Double, double checking probably, the envelope to make sure you have your two keys. <laughs> I still check my closet now to this day, make sure no one <laughs> do, a, do a search of the room. Uh, I heard, yeah, like you're a guy that likes to hang, you're very neat and tidy, hangs everything up once you get into your room. <laughs> Yes, yes. I do like things uh, in a certain manner. I used to, I think at one point I was even packing Spez's stuff for him when we were roommates. I just, it was disgraceful how he'd pack his, his bags. So <laughs> help him out there. Um, 
Uh, so I, I did speak with, with Chris Neal, who told me about an incident one time at a summer skate that you slashed him and he chased you. I remember uh, that. What I was there was, was probably, that the sense plex. There was probably a few uh, altercations with Neeler, and I think Meth can contest to how intense Neeler would get in these summer skates. Um, yes. And I think the, the rest of the pros that that lived in Ottawa could to, could vouch for this. I guess at one point we were competing. Whatever he slashed my stick and he ended up breaking my stick, so I'm standing there with uh, with two pieces and, and one in each hand. So. Obviously, I was a little upset, so I threw both of them at him. And the next thing I know, you know, we have our gloves off. And thank goodness Chris realized uh, the situation. And, uh, you know, he, he had a good laugh. I think my jersey was over my head, what was going on. And he just kind of chuckled. But, uh, yeah, that, that was kind of how that went. I think he dodged both of them. He's, he's pretty agile for a big man. Yeah, he is. And remember, and he's... He's had like several. It's funny you bring that up because I totally forgot about this. Remember, remember the one where we were used to skate with Gary Galley and Kyle Wharton was there and he broke Kyle Wharton's wrist. Do you remember that? I do. And then he almost got into, I think someone gave him good advice. I think he's potentially going to get into a battle of words with Killer in the media. And someone said, <laughs> that, That's right. Just stay away from that one. Right, please. So, so uh, yeah. yeah, I think, it, you know, that's how Neeler played. You know, he couldn't turn it off. And, you know, obviously that's why he played a thousand games plus was he exactly. just, he couldn't turn it off, even if it was in a, in a summer skate with, with teammates and, uh, you know, maybe younger players. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't turn it off with regular like Joe's either. Like he skates in Canada <laughs> at those skates and I've run into people and they've, they flat out told me like, yeah, he's crazy. Like he's, yeah. he, he'll, he'll go just as hard with, anybody else than a former player you know what i mean anyway but i i do agree with everything you just said i i don't i i i can only imagine these poor guys that think oh we're, i'm playing chris neal tonight in men's league maybe we'll have <laughs> years afterwards and no. you don't know what they're getting themselves into yeah yeah for sure um i got more stuff on him later but i'll get back to your career <laughs> sorry is uh when you're playing in ottawa and you had that cup run in 07 uh how would you compare that to 2011 or even 2013, both with Boston? You win the cup in 11. Uh, you go back to the final in 2013. Where does 06, 07 rank? Well, that was obviously such a, you know, a special year. And I think a little bit, I want to say somewhat unexpected. Um, yeah. You know, I knew a good team, but I, you know, did I think we had a, a Stanley Cup uh, contending team? Maybe not. I think you're caught, so caught up in the moment. But, um, you know, it was a big core of, of us that came up from Binghamton that were on that team. I, I think it was my second year full season in, in the NHL. So I remember going out for a warm up in the Stanley Cup final. And be, oh, this is this is the coolest thing. And maybe didn't realize uh, the work that needed to be put into to finishing, finishing it off. Um, obviously, we played against a great Anaheim team that you know had so many good players, but. You know, it was a special group that, that year in Ottawa. And, you know, the thing that, that sticks out for me is, is the fans. Um, you know, how, you know, Elgin Street was packed. We came back from, from losing and, you know, the airport's packed. You know, th those are the things that, that I remember. Um, and, hot, and on the ice, there's a, you know, little that I do remember. Whereas, like, 11, I think it was a, you know, I – Going to Boston, I knew it was a good team, and you know the expectations were were there. I think I think if we hadn't have won, I think it would have been pretty upsetting. Which goalie is more odd, Dominic Hasek or Tim Thomas? Oh, oh they're both they're both odd. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like both unbelievable. Like uh, yeah, you know, I think you'd do anything for them as, as teammates because you knew they helped you win every night. And, um, you know, I went out for dinner with Timmy a lot. I can't say I ever went out for dinner with Dom. I don't know if Dom ever would remember I played with him. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but Timmy, you know, Timmy was a, was a battler. Like he competed, 
Um, he gave you an opportunity to win every night. And, and so did, so did Dom. It was unfortunate that he got hurt at the Olympics. I felt like that, that year we had a really, really good hockey team and, uh, had an opportunity to, uh, to have some success. Did you ever, were you ever part of the group? And I know there was the Alfie, I think Philly and Reds had the dinner with him in Buffalo to convince him to come back. Did you ever have conversations with him or was there ever a time when you can remember going like, Hey Dom, how about today we try it? <laughs> no, I was never, I was far too young. And I think I, I did that. I didn't want that, that role, you know, God bless uh, Alfie Philly and Reds for having to do that. I think I remember John Muckler coming down one time and telling him, all right, Dom, you're going out on the ice. You're putting the gear on. You're going out like enough's enough. And I'm sure you know this story, but sure enough, doesn't he throw on players equipment and goes out and skates. And I think that's when everyone was just like, I don't think this guy is going to skate. Uh, it'll be on his terms. If he does, it doesn't matter what anyone says to him. Mm -hmm. And he used to skate. He'd have that towel wrapped in his track suit. And he would just look like he was carrying a sickle every time he skated with his goalie stick. But, he never, like, when you guys were in practice, he looked phenomenal. He wouldn't let anything buy him. He's like, I'm still not ready. We're like, what do you need? Yeah, oh, he was one of the, like, for being a Hall of Famer and obviously Dom, Dominic Hasek, I used to be terrified to shoot above, like, you know, above the pads, but. He, the games he didn't play, I would stay out after morning skate. He's like, okay, shoot as hard as you can. Shoot at my head. I'd be like, you know, I like that, but I don't want to. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was a very competitive guy, a lot like Timmy, and uh, didn't mind, you know, if you hit him in the head or whatever, or hit him high, he, just as long as he stopped the puck. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I appreciated that as, as a player. Sounds like the perfect guy for Zach Smith. <laughs> yeah i'm sure him and smith really tight that big long wrister <laughs> smithy that, always uh, used to go head hunting um I, so you guys are you know you're flying through you've got this great middle of the 2000s this year the team to beat 2010 rolls around uh and then everything seems to fall apart 2011 at the beginning is the end if you will so uh mike fisher is traded February the 10th, five days later, you get traded to Boston. Did you, did you know at that point stuff was going to happen here? Um, yeah, I, th I think so. Obviously, you know, we had a tough January. I don't know if I can yeah. recall. I don't think we won a game that month. And, you know, Brian, he had a job to do. And obviously things weren't going well for the organization he had some assets, I think. Um, and when we saw Fisher get traded, who we thought would be the last guy to be traded, I think the rest of the group collectively is like, there's going to be a lot of changes going on in the next little bit. So I remember, I think we were in Calgary when, when Fishy got traded. And, you know, like I said, yeah. I remember we lost to the Islanders. I was walking over from the locker room over to uh, the weight room after the game. And I ran into Brian and Brian told me at the time that he had traded me to Boston. And your reaction. The first thing I said to him, I asked him what he got for me. <laughs> <laughs> you got your second he round said, pick. Yes. I said, well, that's pretty good. So, uh, you know, I, I totally understood the, the, the situation. Um, you know, I love Brian Murray, you know, I had him as a coach and a manager and, that that was the, that was the nature of the the business. You know, we put our as players, we kind of put ourselves in that situation. Um, you know, Ottawa always added if we had a great team, they wanted the team to have success, and uh, you know that year we we didn't, and you know changes had to be made. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I was one of them. I was you know obviously wanted to be a center my whole career, and was was devastated at the time, um, but. If you look back, not many managers trade players to, to uh, situations where they're going to succeed. Obviously, Fisher went to Nashville. I think we all kind of understand the reasoning behind that. Um, I went to Boston and, and got put in a great situation in a, in a, a third line where, you know, where I belonged. Um, Kovalev went to, to Pittsburgh where he played before. And, and Rutu, Yarko Rutu went to to Anaheim where there was other Finns. So there was some thought behind all the moves that Brian made. Um, 
and and as a player, I, I appreciated that. It's uh, it's interesting because they also brought in uh, Craig Anderson through that entire thing, and he set that organization up for a, a lot of years, obviously. Um, so so back to Chris Neal for a sec because he says he was par- supposed to be part of the deal with you to go to Boston, and that Brian wouldn't Brian Murray would not give up a first round pick for Chris Neal, or they wouldn't give up a first round pick for Chris Neal. And that's why I didn't go. Did you have is is Neeler just want to hang with you, or is there any truth to this that you know of? I I have, I have no idea. Maybe Neeler knows, you know, something that he spoke with Peter Shirelli. I'm not sure. A first and a second for Neeler and me—that's awfully stiff. When I <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a third line. Yeah, I'm like, oh, no, yeah. no, that those are two high picks. So I don't know. Uh, maybe. Maybe a second and a, and a fourth or whatever for for us to, but uh, yeah, I don't. I who knows? I think you know, trades are so hard to do. Um, I'm sure yeah. now like, being on the other side a little bit to see how it's uh, orchestrated. Uh, I can only imagine it was that difficult back then to to make hockey trades. Hmm. Uh, who is your favorite teammate? Uh, in Ottawa. I know you and Spets are really close. You and Alfie, I'm not sure if there's others, but uh, who did you, who's your biggest, or even I guess Van Allen for that matter. Yeah, I still, I still, you know, I think there was probably three guys and I won't name them in my entire career that I probably didn't like. And it was when I played in the American league. So I'll just leave it at that, that other than that, I only have fond memories of every teammate I had. I don't know if I just, maybe they don't say the same, which they probably don't. And I (laughs) would agree. Uh, um, But like, I still talk to Vanner. I still talk to Red Z. Um, You know, know, these, these guys, like obviously Spezza and, uh, you know, Brian McGratton from time to time. So there was a lot of guys, obviously Chara, who I played with and, you know, in Ottawa and Boston. So there, there's a lot of guys and like, you know, hockey players are, are pretty bad. I don't know how meth is pretty bad at uh, keeping in touch, obviously. Same, you know, the but, same way. But when you see guys, it's like nothing's changed. You know, you yep. can reminisce like, you know, that's a great thing about, you know, I find hockey players is like, oh, they never say, oh, I haven't talked to you. It's like, yeah, hey, what's going on? They're like, it's just like you haven't missed the beat. So, you know, every player I talked to, like Eric Condra, who actually I didn't play with he will you know in training camps and stuff but i know he does development for chicago and we talk mm-hmm. about that and when we run into each other so uh you know obviously zach smith and i saw boro uh, when we played nashville and stuff so uh, i was happy i was on the bench and not on the ice again <laughs> it's true you can just hit it <laughs> off with a lot of players but i'm with you kels when i played in the america because i played a lot in the american league over 200 games like in syracuse and I can still remember maybe a handful of guys, and it's usually just the super vets. You always had a couple guys that are overcompensating a little bit, and they kind of treat some of the younger guys like trash, which you never really got at the NHL level. You might get the odd guy that might not have a lot of time for you being a rookie, but at least he's professional about it, right? Yeah. Which you don't really get the same professionalism at the American League level. So I'm glad you said that because I'm the same way, exact yeah. same way. It's uh, it's funny. I, I uh... Like I said, I have fond memories of all my teammates and, and, you know, hold them at such high regard. I don't know. I just, uh, you know, yeah. players in the NHL are good guys. You know, Great. believe I got, not. Okay. I, I got a name for you then. <laughs> all uh, right. Tom Barrasso. Tom Barrasso. Ah, that's a funny, who brought that? That's a funny thing. Cause well, here's a story on Tom Barrasso. So I, I just gotten drafted to Ottawa. I was 18. I went back, obviously played junior and our season had finished up in London and they, they said, okay, come up, you know, for, to get a summer program and uh, you can watch a game. And um, I said, Oh, this is great. So they bring me up. I think I'm going to, you know, it's right before the the playoffs um, for Ottawa. They're playing Toronto in the first round. I think it's already determined. Um, and they say to me, hey, uh, can you shoot on Tom Barrasso today? I said, pardon me? I'm like, I don't have any equipment, nothing. I, I figure that'll be the end of that. They're like, oh, no, we can give you skates and sticks and whatever. 
So sure enough, here I am shooting on Tom Barrasso and he's supposed to get ready. Like he's getting ready for the playoffs. And I, I find out this later. He's a very intense person. So apparently like I'm a little nervous, you know, shooting on him, not wanting to get it too high or whatever. And I think he, he was a little testy with me, not, not shooting hard enough. And I was, I'm 160 pounds, Tom here. Like this is the best I've got. Um, so <laughs> that's great so he was was he a bit of a dick with you then or? he was a little little bit of a dick but in his defense he's getting ready for the playoffs yeah it would have been he's just, wired a little different wired, too, right? wired different he sees this 18 year old kid that can you know looks like a <laughs> token wet 140 pounds as far as like what are, what are we doing here Good so uh, he was miserable to everybody he gave like so he had a broken finger, I think, at the end in Ottawa, just before the playoffs or during. And so as he's walking away, I said to my camera guy, can you get a shot of his hand? And he just flips us the bird. <laughs> nice. So, so yeah. was, did, he, did he have a reputation? Like, oh, I, he's, I never yeah, played as, with him. He's uh, one of the most right. um, disliked or misunderstood players to ever play in the National Hockey League. Like, he does not really? have a very good reputation. Right. That's why I thought of his name. Yeah. So it was... Uh, uh, he was intense, to say the least. Yeah, yeah, he's he was an interesting duck. Uh, what did you do your day with the Stanley Cup? I know you brought it to Ottawa, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so uh, you know that that's uh, your day with the Stanley Cup. My you know my wife did most of the the planning in terms of like it's worse than a wedding, Brent, because like people don't want to come to your wedding. Like, it's like, oh, I got to buy this guy a gift, blah, 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 whatever. But they want to come to a cup party. It's funny how it works. They're like, oh, yeah, this is great. So make a long story short, I took it to Chio Hospital because as a you. player with Ottawa, we always went there at, at Christmas time. And it was one of the things I enjoyed a lot um, as a player uh, in Ottawa. So was, that was the first thing right away. I thought to myself, if, if I ever win, I, I want to you know bring the cup there. So end up doing that and then um i got advice from from other players that had won the stanley cup and you know took it all in so after that um i went over to uh, stonebridge uh golf golf course and they were nice enough to to have you know like a barbecue and things during the day um in the sense obviously we're we're awesome they they provided a lot of things they um, that they, they travel with a bounty castle shooting things like, so kids had stuff to do. And then, uh, at night I took it, you know, I rented out a, a restaurant and, you know, it was a adults only type of thing. So by the end, I was happy to see it leave. I'd lost my voice. Um, it was, <laughs> it was a long day, but obviously, uh, an enjoyable one. Uh, I didn't get invited to that party, but anyway, um, the... yeah, yeah, you did. Bro. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't. I did go to Ray Bork's though. I always want to bring that story up to meth someday. Um, is oh wait, wait, wait. Okay, yeah. Kels, do you have an inside line with Bork by any chance? <clears throat> oh, I, I, Ray used to be around quite a bit. I haven't seen him. Uh... I'm not asking you to do anything silly. No, here. Don't no, get me wrong. So no, before you I... start shooting it down, like hear me out first. Oh, no. I, 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 I used to, that was the one great thing, not one great thing, but obviously being in Boston, like you'd see, obviously we cams, Cam Neely's around, Bobby Orr would come in, Ray Bork would come in, um, yeah. music. Like, I was like, this is awesome. Like these guys are coming in. And like I said, Ray hasn't been around since I've come back. I don't mm. know if yeah. busy COVID I'm sure it's a, you know, a combination of things. So. Yeah. I, uh, I did a, he was my favorite player growing up, like bar none. I'm, this story is going to take 15 seconds. I did a big project on him in grade five, huge project, my French school. And I sent the Boston Bruins a huge package while he was obviously still playing. Yeah. And you know, you know how it is. We get a million packages at the rink usually, and we don't always get to respond to everybody. So I never got a response back. And I've been basically trolling him on Twitter <laughs> occasionally when he does post some random, you know, charitable thing or whatever. And I'll comment. I'm like, hey, Ray, I'm still waiting for my package. I love you know, it. Sign me something. So I, anyway, if you see him, you know. I'll, I'll remind him. I'll remind him. And, you know, that's funny. Keep him. Like, keep I'll, him pay, up. I'll pay for it. Tell Ray. Like, I'll pay for the postage. I'll pay for the jersey. All that. I just want his goddamn signature. Okay. Yes. 
I'll let them know. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, it comes up every episode, Kels. I don't know why, but it, everybody needs to know about the Ray Borg like, story. That's passionate. You know, he loves, <laughs> he loves, uh, he loves Ray. As I was do a, fan. a lot of, just a fan. Uh, yeah. So anyway. Um, okay. I'd like to ask you about probably the worst day you've had on the ice. Uh, arguably when you broke your leg. <laughs> oh yeah. That was that was probably the, the worst day. Um, and, and it was only 10 seconds into the game. That's the funny thing. I got it out of the way quickly. Um, it felt it so just, bad uh, when that happened. Just a freak accident, to be honest. Um, I caught a rut in front of, um, you know, actually it was Dallas's bench. And I just knew something was wrong. I, I thought it kind of blew my, my knee out. And you know it's it's bad when the other team is is telling the ref to blow it down. Yeah, uh, that that's when I knew I was like, oh, this isn't good. They see something that that potentially I don't see. And you know, Spezza was playing Sagan, like two former teammates. They were right there on the bench. Um, like I said, I thought I just uh, you know blew my knee out, not just, but blew my knee out. So the trainer comes out. I said, all right. He's like, how you doing? I'm like, ah, not great but can you help me up? And obviously big, big Z was there. Z just picks me up, throws me over his shoulder. <laughs> like, like, you know, nothing, which was nice. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be stretchered off or anything like that, but I get into the, into the tunnel and I start getting like lightheaded. But like I, like I said, I still think it's my knee. They take me back into the, the back room or our, our doctors there. And he's a knee specialist. So he has my knee up. And, you know, he thinks he's kind of pulling my knee thinking he's like, well, your knee's pretty solid. And I think, like I said, everybody in that arena would have thought I blew my knee out. Sure enough, the, the technicians, like takes an x-ray and he's, I could see his face. I'm like, well, what is it? He's like, you broke your, it's a, you got a broken femur. And I, he was kind of reluctant to tell me, I was like, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the doctor, I, I didn't know this. The doctor went back into the the other trainers, and I guess he was just he felt so bad. He's like, I was just pulling on this guy's knee, thinking he's got a broken femur. So it was just one of those freak things, honestly, oh. uh that that happened. And you know, I was happy. I didn't want that to be my uh my last, you know, memory of playing in the NHL. Yeah. So, you know, Ottawa, you know, it was it was great to to come back and play in Ottawa and uh, continue my career. Yeah. And you got to continue it. And eventually uh, you ended up at the Olympics as the captain um, and Sochi in 2018 or whatever it was. Now I can't remember. Um, can you talk about that experience and what that was like? And I, I kind of wanted to talk to you about it because of how they went through that this year. And did you pay attention to how things uh, played out this was, year? And it was so memorable that Wally remembers the year that it happened. In. <laughs> it was 18. So it was 2018. I'm old. <laughs> If, if Wally's defense me. mess, like when the NHL players go, yeah, you tune in. I, I, <laughs> I agree. I, I agree. I, you know, now that I see it here, like I'm like absolutely, like you, you kind of take notice. But I'm a hockey fan, like you guys. I want to see Crosby and McDavid, you know, side by side. Like those are things I wanted to see as a as a hockey fan. Um, so. The, the whole situation in 18 was just one of those things that I never thought was going to happen. When I left Ottawa, uh, I went on a, a tryout to Edmonton. I was there till November on a, on a PTO, a uh, professional tryout, and it didn't work out. So I came back to, to Ottawa thinking, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire. I, I tried, just not meant to be. Um, Sean Donovan calls me. And he knew I was skating with Sean Van Allen's uh, Carlton team. And he's like, you know, we need We need a centerman this weekend. And I kind of laughed at him. I'm like, yeah, okay, Sean, whatever. He's like, no, no, seriously, Kels, uh, would you consider playing for us? I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? So my, my thing was like one last kick at it. If I get no traction from NHL teams, you know, I'll finish. So the last game was on the Saturday or whatever. And Friday, my agent calls me and says, uh, would you be interested in playing for uh, Team Canada at the Spangler Cup? So I talked to some friends that had played in it. They said, you got to do it. And and 
it's the best experience I had in hockey family wise. Um, really? Unbelievable. They like hockey Canada is such a good job. Like my kids were there. My wife was there. Like my mom was there. They did. And they were, they were there all the time. They eat pregame meal with you. There's just, it was, it's a different vibe than being in the NHL. NHL is very, you know, business-like. Um, so the tournament finishes up and I said to my agent, listen, can you just see if there's any interest with, with the Olympic team? Um, because if there isn't, I'm, I'm going to retire. Um, he says, yeah, there's interest. He's like, actually you're on the team. So I went back and played with Bell for 20 games and then went and played in the Olympics. It was, it was a cool experience. Um, very stressful. Like I feel for those guys this year because it comes down to one game and it can go any way. And, you know, I'm fortunate for them this year. It didn't go great, but they're, you know, proud, proud Canadians and, and representing their country the best could. And they, they should be proud of, of themselves. Yeah. Well said. And what's it like to have an Olympic medal? Like you're an Olympic, you're an Olympian. That's kind of cool. Yeah, my kids constantly remember remind me it's a bronze, Dad. Don't get too excited. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's uh, it's you know I think it's one of those things when you look back, it's something to be proud of. And I was really proud of that group. We obviously lost to Germany in the semis, which was kind of an upset. I would say um, they had a they had a great first period, and you know they they held on and you know give them credit. Um, but, but uh, the way we bounced back to, to beat the Czechs in the, the bronze medal game the next day, I was very proud of that group. Did you do the opening or closing ceremonies? Did you walk in either I, one of those? Please. The opening, opening ceremony. How yeah. cool was that? Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome just to be around the other athletes. That was probably the, the, the thing I took away the most from, from the Olympics was being around the other athletes. I knew what hockey players went through and heard their stories, but you know, the figure skaters, the, the bobsledders, you know, the skiers, like mm. such a grind for, for yeah. these, they're there. They love their sport. They love their craft more than anything. Uh, I just want finally, before we let you go, I touch on just you being a, an assistant coach with Boston. Obviously there was a chance that I thought you were going to be on the bench in Ottawa and it didn't pan out. Were you disappointed that you didn't get a chance in Ottawa? And how is it uh, for you now, obviously on a Stanley cup contending team to be an assistant coach? No, I, you know, I think, you know, Pierre Dorian gave me, gave me an opportunity to play when I came back, he gave me an opportunity in the development role there and, you know, got to see, you know, everything, all aspects of, uh, you know, management and, and then eventually got to coach a little bit with Mark Crawford and, and Crow was awesome with me. And, you know, I think, you know, I think they made a great decision with DJ Smith. I think he's a great coach. He has playing well. You know, they got some some superstars that uh, obviously there's been a bit of a the injury bug this year with some of them. But, um, you know, I, I'm nothing but grateful to the, the Suns organization for for everything they've given me in hockey. Uh, do, do you like Brad Marchand? <laughs> uh, uh, is this on record, Brad? Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not recording anymore. Yes. No, uh, yeah, Marcy is, uh, I hold him in high regard. Um, I know a lot of people think he's a certain way on, on the ice, which, you know, and they think that that's how he is off the ice. He is a great teammate. He's a good family person. Um, very intense as, as, uh, I think everyone realizes at times, but, um, you know, a big, big reason why I have a, a Stanley cup ring, you know, he comes mm -hmm. in as a, he scores two goals in game seven. Um, and uh, he, he's the ultimate competitor. Uh, last question before we let you go. Uh, if you were to sit in your room tonight and watch uh, TV, what is your favorite snack? Favorite snack? I'm not much of a snacker. Maybe maybe chips if I was going to snack. I'm not a popcorn guy. I know like a lot of coaches now I realize popcorn comes over for the game. And uh <laughs> They treat themselves. I'm not a. I'm not a. I'm not a big snacker. I. I, Kel, eat, I eat. Have you had to scale back your pregame meals? Like when you're in the room with the guys, <laughs> like make adjustments, or are you still just loading up on pasta and chicken or chicken parm? Uh, 
I've had to switch over to rice and maybe portion sizes are a little down. I do work <laughs> out most mornings because Good for uh, you. I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to buy any more clothes. I don't want to be that guy that can't fit in his suits anymore. So <laughs> that's more, more of the motivation than anything. Uh, yeah. Right on. So good. Uh, Chris Kelly, I, I appreciate you stopping by. It's been fun. Like if Chris Neal calls you the best chirper he's ever met, then you know, you've done something right. I don't know. He was, he could throw some daggers, Neeler. He had, he had his moments. It's good to see him doing well. Yeah. He's always around. Uh, we appreciate it. So we look forward to seeing you in the postseason. All the success with the Boston Bruins this year, my friend. Thank you for having me, guys. Thanks, Kels. All right. Thanks very much to Chris Kelly, as always. Uh, a great guy to talk to. We'll hope to look to hook up again at some point later down the road. Uh, a reminder, today's guest brought to you by the cool, refreshing taste of whitewater beer. New flavor, kiwi lime sour. Use the coupon code wham.funkyfresh at shopwhitewater.ca and get 15% off your order. Uh, don't forget home delivery. Uh, whitewater, brewed by friends, for friends. Speaking of friends, Greg is into the show today. Lots to talk about, including your upcoming trip, which you uh, happily bragged about for Hell a while. Yeah. Yeah. Hell so yeah. <laughs> before we get to that, I, there was something I wanted to talk about, but I had to move it. It's on like page five. That's uh, Jack Eichel's returning to Buffalo. What do we think the reception is going to be? And Matthew, you've obviously seen an awful lot of these receptions throughout your career. Uh, have you ever seen one A go bad, but B, what do you think of the Eichel return? Oh, they're going to boo him for sure. I mean, how, <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? And I, I like Eichel. I like fantastic player. He was special when I used to play against him. When he came into the league, you know, he was playing on a, just a dog shit hockey team. Right. And not to his fault or the, the organization's fault. It was just the timing of it all. And right at the rebuild stage, mind you, I feel like they've been in this state of rebuild for like 12 years, but in any case, they're now going to be the Jack I team with the longest streak of missing the postseason. Well, okay. But you know what? All that moaning and bitching and complaining about playing in Buffalo didn't really seem to hurt Jack Eichel. Now he's playing in Las Vegas on a top tier hockey club between uh, Chandler Stevenson and Max Pacioretty. So, you know, maybe the villain won this time, right? With Jack Eichel, if you want to call it that. So I'm okay with it, you know, and I'm okay with the boo birds. It's entertainment. Like if you're a fan and you're watching it, it adds a little spice to the game and with a nice little storyline, I think it's great. Craig, what happens? Oh yeah, he definitely gets booed. But I mean, like, like, <laughs> like Matt said, that's a, like, he gets booed for one. Uh, he, he goes to Buffalo what, once a year. Yeah. Down out West. So he's going to get booed one out of 82 games a year. And then the rest of the time he's playing on a cup contender out in <laughs> Vegas, really good team, number one center, getting paid. Like, and, I and know, I've, I've been out there. Like I was, I was at Mark Stone's wedding. Like you guys have to see the setup they have, you know, yeah. I, I can't. And we heard Nick Holden talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Holdy that mentioned it. I mean, they're, these guys are spoiled. So like the areas, the suburbs that they live in are, are gorgeous. Like when you think Vegas, this is how I always thought too, right? You think Vegas, like the grungy strip, it's not, you know, it's kind of gross during the day and whatever, but it's, it's Vegas, yeah. but the, the, the suburbs are gorgeous and it's, it's affordable, beautiful homes. These guys are making bank playing over there in the nice weather. I mean, it worked out well for them. So, and I know Stoney loves it. Like Stoney doesn't want to come back. Mark Stone loves playing in Las Vegas. And I think they're living there year round now. So that goes yeah. to tell you and show you, you know, what kind of impact playing in that city has. Did Eichel ever play with anybody as good as Mark Stone in Buffalo? Like, I don't, I, it's hard, maybe it's hard to say. Uh, so, I mean, he, he's like, he's on a better team. Not like did he play had, with Taylor Hall. Have, like, was no, he had, and they also had, they also had, no, no, but it, they had um, at the time, was it Molson? Matt Molson was there. Oh, uh, sure. Ocpozo at the time was still pretty good. This is Jeff Skinner. Uh, Skins. He, he Tyler Ennis. Season. Tyler, the best ever do The it. greatest Tyler to ever do it, yeah. Tyler Ennis. He was there. Um, yeah. But no, the answer you know is what? no. He has to. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, but they were They were good. They weren't, but... they weren't bad. They. I just found like those years where Eichel was there, they were just missing a couple pieces and they were underperforming. You know, I... Anyway, I just don't sure. think they did a good job surrounding him with long-term pieces, I right? Agree. And they and got they to the point they, where and then he, they, he, yeah, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say he he was like weathering the load of he was the 
the top pick and, they, and all that other they stuff. Made him and, yeah. They made him captain. They made him captain. Like he should not have been the team captain. I'm sorry, but that yeah. was to appease him. I'm sure kind of throw yeah. him a bone, but it, look how that worked out. So uh, never see, rush that. Anyway. It's funny you say that on this date in NHL history. And like in 2000, Vinny LeCavalier was named the captain of the Tampa Bay lightning, the youngest to ever do it at the time. Uh, mm-hmm. They stripped the C off of him years later. Uh, so like doesn't work. If if Vinny LeCavalier or anybody who's a 19 year old and even Sidney Crosby is your captain, Beth, like what is that dynamic like in the room? Like, do they pay attention well, because he has a letter? The... Yeah. Well, you he's already got the team's respect because he's arguably the best player on the team, right? But it doesn't mean you're the best, doesn't mean you're the leader. That's right. the that's the problem. Like we we heard um who was talking about uh Who's talking about Yashin? Who do we have talking about? Could have been Yashin? Shane Knighty. Could have been oh, Jason Knight. Howard. Yeah. Or Radic. Or Radic. Yeah, we yeah. talked about Yashin with both and how that was another good example of a team that probably felt a little inclined to give the captaincy to the player or individual because yeah. they wanted to make them feel good and important. It doesn't work. I mean, players see right through that stuff. You can't fool the locker room. The locker room has the best pulse on who's who, you know, with regards to leaders and whatnot. And I mean, it it sometimes can just kind of take a turn for the worse if you give the wrong guy the letter because all of a sudden he feels the need to speak up and players are already tuning him out and your guys are rolling their eyes going, oh, just shut up. You know what I mean? Like that's unfortunately how it works oftentimes when you give a guy that shouldn't be the captain the captaincy. I got the wrath from John Tortorella actually over this. Uh, The year they stripped the captaincy off uh, Le Cavalier, they came to Ottawa for an exhibition game and Ian Mendez and I, I think are side by side. Anyway, I said, yeah. Uh, can you talk about the C? And he goes, why do I have to come to Canada to find out about my own hockey team? I was like, oh, here we go. Yeah, he was not happy with me. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, I'm um, sure he wouldn't appreciate that. So, Matt, do you remember your welcome back to Ottawa video tribute? You were up in the, the I yeah, think you ran it when you were up top. in the oh, you, press yeah, box. Yeah, right? my, my hand. I still have the scar on my hand. I blocked a shot in Montreal. And it just a big scar down my palm. I had my hand out, freak accident the night before in Montreal and took a shot and, and it just exploded. It was gross. And uh, so I couldn't even hold my stick. So yeah, I was up in the crowd, but I remember the tribute video it was really nice, uh, really cool, really appreciated it, but it was too bad I couldn't play in that game. Mind you, I wasn't looking forward to playing at all in that in that building. Like I, I just, being, you know, being from Ottawa and how special it was for me, it was really uncomfortable. Even when I finally did end up coming back the following season, um, I, it was a nightmare. Like I, I was, I played terrible. I didn't want to be there. I wanted the game to get over with. Uh, it wasn't enjoyable for me. So, uh, was it on the calendar? Like, could you keep see it? Like, could you see it coming up and no. kind of dreading it? Were you, or no. just that day? I never looked, I never looked at the schedule when I played, like I never paid attention to that. I was always, some, there, were, there were times when I was playing that I was unaware who I was playing next. Like we could be, you know, where are we going on Tuesday? Oh, St. Louis. Yeah. We're fine. It's like, like the I show we do. There's, there were so many games, like it's hockey, you know, it's not like the NFL, like where, you know, you've got the one game to look forward to. So it was almost easier to just be ignorant about it and not pay too much attention because that would just, you know, you're you already have enough on your plate looking forward to, you know, that next game or that game night, you weren't thinking too far ahead. So was it emotional watching old highlights? Yeah, a little bit, I guess. I mean, I think so I just missed it more than anything. It didn't make me yeah. I choked up, but I mean, I was, you know, I, I just missed playing in front of the fans here. Like I just had such a deep appreciation for the fan base and, and playing in front of my family and my friends. It was such a cool thing. So I got a little bit of that flashback, but I mean, no, I didn't get choked up or anything. It okay. was just nice to, for the team to have done that. What's it like then to play for your hometown team and see a fan wearing your name on the back of the hometown Jersey? What, what do you mean? Like me walking around at the time, seeing Ottawa Sens fans wearing my jersey? Yeah, seeing a Mark Mathot jersey. Like, like yeah, that's I a mean, team you great. grew up cheering, right? So, yeah, you watch yeah, the Alpha. Cool. But I mean, jersey. yeah, like, but I never looked at it like that because at that point when I came to Ottawa, I was already an established player, right? So it's like it'd be one thing if I was drafted by the team and then came in. I'm like, oh my gosh, like they're wearing my jersey. You know, I I was already yeah. used to that in Columbus a little bit, so that wasn't like an oddity, but. Yeah, I guess the, for me, the biggest, the nostalgic thing that I would deal with in Ottawa was the sense the the intro song, you know, like the, the classic sense jingle that would play yeah. when you come da, out on da, the da, ice. Da, da, da. To me, that was the coolest thing. Cause 
Yeah, because I remembered that going to games as a, as a teen or as a kid, yeah. right? That was always cool, even at the Civic Center. I mean, that was really neat, like being able to first come out. Those first few games, hearing that sound, I'll never forget it. Ah. Brent, what was it like for you? Because I never wandered over to the visitor locker room. Like my job was the Ottawa Senators. I just covered that stuff. When a guy comes back, like, is that something you, like you guys keep track of? Because I never really, pay, like other yeah. than we might have to crank out a return I, video or something, I, but that's a, that's a to-do list for you, right? I got tired of it. It became always the grudge <laughs> storyline. Like Shane, Knight, and I'll, I'll use anybody that t- didn't play like Shane Knighty's returning. And you're like, oh, are you excited to play? Like they played yeah. 20 games here or whatever, but the big guys that came back, like the Carlson's or I get you yeah, know, yeah. meth or those guys, the Alfie one, the Alfie one will always stand out for me forever, but those guys matter. But I just get tired of the facing your former team storylines. I was supposed to go to Florida to cover Jacques Martin facing the Sens for the first time, but then there was <laughs> hurricane Irene went through and they said, yeah, you can't go. And I was like, damn it. But right. yeah. So I, it, this it's the same storyline. Then the players go, ah, it'll be special. Just get through it. They say on. all the same stuff. Occasionally yeah. you get a player go, you know what? Like you said, I was like, it was nerving or it was whatever. Sometimes you get yeah. that. So the whole reason you ask all the other ones is to get that one guy that goes like, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't handle a puck. I couldn't do it. That's what you're waiting for. Yeah. And that's how I so, felt. That was how I yeah. felt. Yeah. But some uh, guys are just better about it. More confident, you know? Yeah. Um, Craig, quickly, you had to do the Eric Carlson return video, if I'm not mistaken. Which, what do you, yeah, what do you, what, what do you do that one? Yeah. But it, like, there was some issues with that that had to be, it had to yeah. be censored. We had, well, yeah, we had to get it approved. Uh, it was one of those where, like, that was a very contentious one because obviously it wasn't the best divorce between the team and uh-huh. the player and stuff. So, yeah, it was, it was a little frustrating. There were some things we were asked to take out because it, I don't know, it shined too positive of a light on Eric Carlson. But I mean, it, even that, it's like, it's hard to, it, you, when you play those things in, up in the, the rink, right, you'll see, like, it's hard to really appreciate all the sound bites and all those yeah. things. We really just started making them for A, like, so we could get that video of the guy. It gives, it, it just kind of lets the air out of the building, right? You, you run the video, it, it, it's the kind of conclusion, the guy gets to wave for a second, and yep. then it's, all right, we're done. That's it. We're done with this. So it was really, a lot of the times, it's nice to welcome those guys back, but we did it for everybody like you said man it seemed like Which every other week there's yeah 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 and i mean we did some for like a guy like Demello. we did his too and we like we got some sl- slack for that the guys they're like he played here for like a year and a half and like he gets a welcome <laughs> back video it's like well we had a lot of content we had a lot of content with him so we wanted to use it and so whatever yeah. but and then there's other times when it's like do you do it for everybody like where's the cutoff point because guys come yep. and go yep. so i mean it just got to a point where like you're saying it was exhausting you have so many guys leaving that you're just you, you become a welcome like we had it we had it split up like content team would do some the game production people would do some like there were so many to do that we would i mean even this year i'm pretty sure they've had to do some right like i think it was this cc's first game back this year I yes think. like there's yeah. another guy like okay let's do it for cc right but it's been so long you forget yeah. that and you got to like really track these things and so the question i was going to ask meth is like do you like did you expect that when you came back like do you go oh they're going to do a big video thing to me or is that something you don't even think about <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I sort of expected to a degree because I played a lot of games in Ottawa, and yeah. Um, but I, I mean, you don't. You're not. Ex- you're not. You're not hoping that it's going to happen. I think you're more or less just trying to prepare for it because it can, it can get emotional. And but you you guys nailed it. Like if you if you've been on any given organization for like a cup of tea, and then you come back and there's a, <laughs> and then there's a tribute video. <laughs> I find it get now. I'm not some outrage dude. That's like, Oh, you got to stop doing the attribute videos. I don't yeah. give a shit. I think it's good content. Yeah. I think it's entertaining yeah. for the fans. It breaks up the game. Like who cares? Yeah, but yeah. I mean, do I think it's necessary for those types of players to get them? No, but I don't mind organizations doing them. Yeah. Can't wait for the Michael Delzato return video. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, so next week it may all go to hell in a handbasket as uh, Craig is now about to put on his speedo and lather up and sit on a beach. That's right. Sombrero as well. Probably. I think too. Yes. I'm out of here boys for about a week. Uh, I'm going to listen. I'm going to be around. I'm still going to help out with things, but I think we're doing a couple live shows next week. 
Yes. That's the plan, I think. So uh, that's an Alex Alex production on uh, most of that stuff. I'll try and help from afar here. And then I might pop in, say hello from the beach or the pool or the bar or wherever I end up. Um, but yeah, so out of here for a little bit. Gonna enjoy some different weather. Man, we've been stuck here for so long. I got to hear about Meth's trip yeah. uh, a while ago. So yeah, it's our turn now. We're going to out of here for a bit. Yeah. Good for you. I will. Uh, you do have a bit of leeway since Meth was supposed to call into the show and didn't. So if you don't, I guess it'll be precedent setting you're okay yeah there is yeah. there's a good chance my wife is going to take my head off if i believe to go to do the wally and Matt show in the middle yeah. of our vacation yeah hold so on I a second thought, yeah. i'm going to avoid getting into a domestic with her and especially <laughs> down south and just going to sit sit in my lawn chair and have a drink and that's what yeah, i did fair so enough. Yeah. so it's well learned greg we uh we wish you a safe and happy holiday with your family yeah thank you yeah. All right. Uh, we will see you on Monday. James Duffy is going to stop by live at 1 p.m. on Monday. We're going to chat about Trade oh. Center and all the stuff that happens nice. on that nonsensical show. We'll talk about the Jeff O'Neill incident with the ketchup and when I was live and had no idea what was going on. So that's on Monday. Don't forget, go to gongshowgear.ca, order up the WAM merchandise. Craig, get on the plane, and we will see you uh, soon, guys. That's the Wally Matthau Show.